Hello everyone, welcome to the program and a happy new year. I'm Jokia Rogers here in Lagos. At least 20 people have been killed in Somalia's breakaway region of Somaliland in clashes between anti-government protesters and security forces over several days. For more than a week, police and the military have been battling the protesters in Lasakanud, a town in Somaliland's east, which is disputed between Somaliland and neighboring Puntland. According to Mohamed Farah, a doctor at Lasakanud Hospital, at least 20 people had been killed and dozens more injured. He said that he had seen the bodies of victims brought into the facility. Protesters are demanding that Somaliland hands over control of the town to Puntland and also accuse security forces of failing to end insecurity in the town. Somaliland broke away from Somalia in 1991 but has not gained widespread international recognition for its independence. The region has been mostly peaceful while Somalia has been grappled with three decades of civil war. The European Union has urged Rwanda to stop supporting the M23 rebels, uh, captured, uh, supporting them, which has captured swathes of territory in North Kivu province in the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. The DRC, along with the United States and several European countries, has repeatedly accused its smaller Central African neighbor, Rwanda, of backing the M23, although Ghali denies the charge. The Tutsi rebel group has, in recent months, advanced to within a few dozen kilometers of North Kivu's capital, Goma. EU foreign policy chief, Josep Borrell, said that the European bloc had urged Rwanda to stop supporting M23 and use all means to press the M23 to comply with the decisions taken by the East African community. Borrell's comments came after a United Nations experts' report on DRC indicated it had collected proof of direct intervention by Rwandan defense forces inside the DRC territory between November 2021 and October 2022. Mr. Borrell called on Kinshasa to take all necessary measures to protect the civilian population in its territory. Meanwhile, over 250,000 people have been displaced in the latest offensive by the M23 group, whose seizure of land in North Kivu province has severed key trade routes and the disrupted farming, which is the backbone of the local economy. Take a listen. Since fighting surged in the Congolese city of Goma again in October, Prices for everyday essentials such as maize, beans and charcoal have almost doubled because the violence by the M23 rebels has made roads impassable and forced farming cooperatives to close in Rushuru, the breadbasket of the province. Boiteta maize flour mill has had to slash production by 90% to around 50 tons per month due to the drop in supply of unprocessed kernels. We have stopped machines because there is a problem with the supply of raw materials. As you have seen yourself, it is not business as usual. We just have a small amount and will soon run out. So we stop the machines so as not to waste energy. Since the raw material is not there, while waiting for the raw materials to arrive, we find it wise to stop the work. Due to the security situation, all the roads that supply goods to the city of Goma have been closed. We have been waiting since the day before yesterday for the goods. The delays caused by Constance put the factory in shutdown and one does not work. Factory worker Innocent Bahati laments on the scarcity of corn and having nothing productive to do. We are outside because there's nothing to do in the factory. There is no corn. Because of the problems in the north, we miss the corn. We will be working at the moment. But the problem started when the war started on that side. The corn no longer comes. It's really since the M23 war that we haven't had a good amount of corn. We don't know if our families will survive because we don't have enough to eat. That's why I'm here outside. I have nothing else to do. Because of the war, we have no more corn. The fallout from the supply chain issues is being felt across the city, where cash-strapped households depend on maize flour to feed their families.
And two Senegalese opposition members of parliament have been sentenced to six months in prison for hitting a fellow MP at the National Assembly. On the December 1, MP Masata Samb attacked his colleague Amy Ndiaye from the gallery over statements he had made against the leader of a member of the main opposition coalition who is not a member of parliament. The images that have taken the Senegalese social media by storm show Masata Samb and his colleague Mamadou Niang slapping and kicking the pregnant Mrs Ndiaye in her stomach during the assembly. According to her lawyer, she was hospitalized after the incident and risks losing her baby. The lawyer adds that she has been released from hospital but remains in an extremely difficult situation. The two parliamentarians imprisoned since 5 December 15 were tried on December 19th by the court of uh, flagrant delicto in Dakar. The court also sentenced them on Monday to pay a fine of 100,000 suffer francs, that's uh, 150 euros each, and jointly uh, damages of 5 million suffer francs uh, for assault and battery on Amy Ndiaye. The prosecution has requested two years, had requested two years in prison. Ivorian President Alison Watara has assured that the 46 Ivorian soldiers detained in Mali for nearly six months and who have just been sentenced to 20 years in prison in Bamako will soon return to Ivorian soil. In his NVS speech, the president said his thoughts are particularly with the soldiers detained in Mali since uh, July the 10th. The 46 other soldiers will soon return uh, to the country. The 46 who were suspected of being mercenaries have been held in Mali since July. They were sentenced last week to 20 years in prison before the expiry of the ultimatum set by West African heads of state to the Malian junta to release them. They were found guilty of attacking and plotting against the government and undermining the external security of the state. Elsewhere, putting a rather hectic year behind South Africans ushered in 2023 with moderate celebrations. The Johannesburg New Year's Eve countdown uh, the countdown party was cancelled by the mayor Umfo Balatse as the country grapples with the Christmas Eve gas truck disaster that left 34 people dead. President Zero Ramaphosa, in his message, appeals to all citizens to work together to pull the nation out of the many challenges it's dealing with. From a Nigerian perspective, the heads of Nigeria's two missions in South Africa appeal to Nigerians, wherever they are, to always do what will make Nigeria proud while reassuring them that the Nigerian government will keep ensuring that they are protected. 2023, the hope is for many things gone wrong with the world to get right, or at least get better. Happy New Year! Let us enter 2023 with the courage and resilience for which we are known. Let us keep going and keep trying no matter how difficult it gets. By working together, we can and will rebuild our country. We can and will improve our economy and improve the lives of our people. Nigeria's High Commissioner to South Africa, Ambassador Mohamed Manta, in his message, appealed for peace among Nigerians in the host country, as well as those back home, ahead of the general elections. I send warm greetings to fellow Nigerians back home, to continue to pray for the country, to continue to pray for those of us outside, and to look forward with prayers towards the elections in February, and use this period to also ensure that all activities during the electioneering are devoid of violence, are devoid of rancor. Added to the unending delays with permit and visa renewals by South Africa's Home Affairs Department, 2022 was quite a hectic year for some Nigerians in South Africa, with an alarming number of killings of Nigerians by fellow Nigerians. Word on the street is that this is owing to secret cult wars among Nigerians. There's also the vigilante anti-drug attacks 
an anti-foreigner tax which sometimes finds law-abiding Nigerians caught in the middle. We're doing our best to work with the host government and see and ensure and put an end to these attacks and killings. They are unnecessary, they are unlawful, they should not happen. I do wish to seize the opportunity to call on these boys on the streets to sit their swords and imbibe dialogue. The various associations, especially under Nikasa, has offered them uh, a forum for dialogue. From fellow Nigerians, the wish is for more responsible citizenship. Let Nigerians behave themselves. Let be our brothers and sisters keepers at all times. For Nigerians uh, at home, um, compliments of the seasons. The election is coming on the 23rd of February. Uh, my wish is that we select a good leader that's going to change our country for better. And with those words to live by in 2023, he is hoping for a more peaceful, prosperous year. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television. To health matters now, the authorities in Malawi have suspended primary and secondary schools opening in two major cities following a cholera outbreak that has so far killed 595 people. Schools in the capital and the commercial hub will remain closed for at least two more weeks after the Christmas holidays. The cholera outbreak began in March 2022 but has become acutely acute lately. The outbreak has spread to nearly all of Malawi's 28 districts and at least 19 people have died on New Year's Eve alone. Cholera is contracted by eating food or drinking water contaminated with the bacterium Vibrio cholerae. It can affect children and adults, causing severe diarrhea and can kill within hours if left untreated. The Africa Centers for Disease Control say that uh, says that uh, it's uh, concerned about the rise in cholera deaths in Malawi, which it attributes to patients not getting treatment in time. The announcement has angered some parents who say their children were already on their way to school, which had been due to reopen on Tuesday. Health Minister Kumbize Chiponda said the government regrets uh, any inconvenience and that the late advice was taken solely in the interest of the safety of the learners. Egypt has announced a record revenue of nearly 8 billion U.S. dollars from the Suez Canal. And the Canal Authority says it's expecting a better performance in 2023. Driven by a surge in demand for goods across the globe as more countries removed COVID-19 restrictions, earnings from the canal rose by over 25% year-on-year to some 7.932 billion U.S. dollars in 2022. Egypt's Suez Canal has seen more than 23,000 ships carry 1.4 billion tons of cargo crossing the connector between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea in 2022. The revenue for 2021 was $6.33 billion. And experts attributed the record revenues to successful marketing policies and growing demands thanks to the proven significance of the canal to the maritime energy transport. I think these record revenues reflect the success of the operation and marketing policies for the Suez Canal. Besides the increment in fees, the rise in petroleum ships participated strongly as well. The blockage of the canal in 2021 has proved the importance and cost-effectiveness of the waterway and that helps to increase demand for using it. Around 12% of the world trade goes through the canal the fastest maritime route between Asia, East Africa and Europe. The Suez Canal Authority Chairman Osama Rabi says the record revenue increase seen annually in recent years goes back to the additional expansion introduced in 2015. When we dug the new Suez Canal project, we aim to double the canal's revenues by 2023. We're in 2022 and we've accomplished that already. Almost $8 billion, 23,000 ships are a huge number.
We used to have 42 ships passing daily. We are now seeing 80. We are also adding services to the canal to expand its revenues further. The Suez Canal is leading 14 development projects in 2023, worth nearly $530 million. They aim at expanding and deepening parts of the waterway, as well as improving its logistical services to crossing ships. The Suez Canal started the legal process to establish its own investment fund to maximize profitability from its surplus. Authorities are expecting an even better performance in 2023 after raising tariffs by between 10 and 15 percent from starting January 2023. That helps to increase demand. Back in Nigeria, in Taraba State, in the northeast of the country, no fewer than 16,000 Nigerian refugees in the Republic of Cameroon and Chad have been evacuated after spending years in a refugee camp in those countries. The evacuation facilitated by the state governor, Darius Ishaku, is aimed at giving the residents who are predominantly fishermen a sense of belonging after over 40 of them were killed for refusing to pay levies to Boko Haram insurgents in the republics of Cameroon and Chad. In the year 2016, over 40 fishermen from the Jukunwanu speaking area of Bukhari local government in Taraba state were reported to have been executed by Boko Haram insurgents in the Lake Chad Basin area while carrying out their fishing activities. Jukunwanu is translated to mean live beside the water, but the incident forced them to flee and migrate through the rivers connecting Nigeria to the Republic of Cameroon to continue their fishing business and to live. This situation prompted Governor Dario Sishaku to collaborate with the government of Chad and Cameroon to evacuate them to their homeland. During a visit to one of the camps where they are taking temporary shelter, Governor Darius Sishaku sues for peace as he assures them of continued efforts to bring home others. To kindly live in peace, stay in peace. At least some of you have been rescued, you have where to stay. But some of your people are still not settled in IDP camps like you are here. So you should thank God Almighty for the fact that you are staying here. We are still battling with some that we have not actually given in the IDP camp to stay. Leader of the evacuation exercise explains the process involved and how they have succeeded in managing the situation. And you directed that we should do whatever possible to bring them back home. And this explains the reason why we are here. The first sets that we evacuated were settled in Kashimbila. And the second, we settled them in Wukari local government. Today, these third sets are here in Ibi local government. We really appreciate your support that has enabled us to successfully move these people here. Evacuations have so far taken place in three batches in separate locations of Takum, Wukari and Ibi local government areas of Taraba State. Outside Nigeria now, Morocco will impose a ban on people arriving from China, uh, whatever their nationality, from January the 3rd to avert any new wave of coronavirus infections. That's according to the country's foreign ministry. Several countries have imposed restrictions on travelers from China due to a surge in COVID-19 cases. Thousands of tourists visit Morocco from China every year, usually traveling on flights that come via the Gulf. In an abrupt change of policy, China this month began dismantling the world's strictest COVID-19 regime of lockdowns and extensive testing, putting its battered economy on course for a complete reopening next year. But according to some international health experts, the lifting of restrictions has led to COVID spreading largely unchecked and likely infecting millions of people a day there. Still in Morocco, Mohammed VI Football Academy is a facility that every young uh, man in the country hopes to visit, young man or woman, hopes to visit as they try to emulate the success of the country's 
alumni who took the national team to the World Cup semi-final. The Football Academy gives young Moroccans a sense of fulfillment and an opportunity to kickstart their soccer career. Since its inauguration by His Majesty King Mohammed VI in March 2010, one of the major goals of the Morocco Football Academy is to provide players of the national teams and national clubs, as well as to be a role model for all national clubs and sports associations. Morocco spent $13 million to build the Mohammed VI Football Academy in 2010 when the kingdom's soccer scene was in the doldrums, lagging behind their African counterparts after having failed to reach the World Cup since 1998. The nation's principal academy brings in talent from across the country. The World Cup participation of players who graduated from the academy and their run to reach the semi-finals for the first time in the history of Arabs and Africa gives a sense of pride and honor to all technical, medical and administrative staff who supported these players in reaching this high level and honoring Morocco on the world's biggest stage. The academy stretches is over 17 hectares and has its own boarding house, restaurant, clinic, entertainment hall, swimming pool and classrooms, as well as nine pitches, including a covered one. The curriculum combines training on the pitch with classrooms. Players at Mohammed VI Academy go through three stages in order to reach the highest level. The first stage is recruitment, which is the key phase. Then there is a stage of improving the players' performance that happens in the academy over years of effort. The third stage that is very important is to help the player prepare his career to be ready to play at high level. Most students leave the academy with a bachelor's degree, while others have gone to play in Europe. The coach says the football academy flooded with applications after the Moroccan national team's run at the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Well, that's it on Network Africa. Thank you for watching. I'm Jocker Rogers.